Hello and welcome to today's Iran Exile Hangout. I'm Michael Solano Mullings, and before we get started, I'd like to tell you about Samsonia Way and the work that we do. Samsoniaway.org is an online magazine with interviews, columns, literary excerpts, essays, and multimedia features by writers from around the world, along with daily coverage of global threats to writers. Samsoniaway.org is published by City of Asylum Pittsburgh, an organization that advocates for creative free expression as a basic human right. Our Exile Hangout is a unique space where exile writers talk, debate, and share ideas about literature and the current situation in their home countries. Today's Hangout brings together distinguished Iranian writers for an open conversation on literature, freedom of expression, and why not, maybe a bit of politics. We encourage you to join the conversation, submit your questions via YouTube, or on Twitter using the hashtag Exile Hangout. It's now time to turn to today's moderator, Iranian author Marina Nimat. Hi, Marina. Hi, Michael. Thank you so, so much for this opportunity. We all very much appreciate it. So I'm going to jump in and uh, introduce everybody who is on the panel right now. So I'm going to start with Mr. Omid Fallahazad. Uh, Omid is an Iranian-American writer who was born and raised in Iran and moved to the U.S. in 2001. By then, some of his fiction had slipped past the censors and appeared in the literary magazines such as Asri Panchambe. Raftegan, his story about Iran-Iraq war, was shortlisted for the 2004 Bahram Sadiqi online contest. Recently, his fiction in English appeared in the literary journal Paul Revere's Horse and in Tremors, a newly published anthology of Iranian-American writers. Then we have Ms. Moniro Ravani Pur. Moniro was born in a village near Boucher in Iran in 1952. She has 12 books published in Iran and translations of some of her works have appeared in the West. She has written many screenplays for movie and theater and has also written many children's books. In 2007, she was a visiting fellow in the International Writers Program at Brown's University's Watson Institute. Ravonipur's work considered non-conformist and honest in its portrayal of Iranians has elicited government scrutiny in recent years. In late 2006, all copies of her new book were stripped from bookstore shelves in Iran in a countrywide police swoop. Two more of her novels are currently under review by Iran's Ministry of Culture and Islamic Guidance. Then we have Ms. Shahnoush Parsipur. Ms. Parsipur was born in 1946 in Tehran, Iran. She published uh, short stories before publishing her first novel at the age of 28. After she protested the execution of two poets during the time of the Shah, she was arrested by Savak, the Shah's secret police, and spent 54 days in prison. Then she went to France to study Chinese language and civilization, but went back to Iran during the Islamic Revolution of 1979, after the success of which she was arrested three times and spent more than four years in prison. Altogether, she has written 13 books and has translated four. Currently, Shahnoush lives in the United States of America. Now, uh, last, uh, yours truly, uh, I'm Marina Nemat. I was born in 1965 in Tehran, Iran, and I currently live in Canada. After the Islamic Revolution of 1979, I was arrested at the age of 16 and spent more than two years in Ebin, a political prison in Tehran. My memoirs, Prisoner of Tehran and After Tehran, have been published in 29 countries. I received the inaugural Human Dignity Award from the European Parliament in 2007, and I teach memoir writing at the School of Continuing Studies at the University of Toronto. So again, I thank everybody for being here, all of our writers. Um, I have to admit that I am a very big fan of both Ms. Parsipur and Ms. Ravonipur. So this is just uh, an honor to be here on the same panel with them, and I totally appreciate it. Um, now we welcome everybody who's joining us online. It's absolutely an honor to have you. 
and you will have the opportunity to submit your questions. But I have prepared my own questions, and I'm going to start with Miss Rabonipur, and I'm going to ask her the very first one, and then we are going to work our way through the panel and asking everybody's opinion. So, um, Moniru, uh, let's start with you. My first question is, how do you think the current dictatorship in Iran whose reign began in 1979 with the success of the Islamic Revolution has affected your uh, life as a writer and your works. Hello, everybody, right and thank you, uh, Marina, for your great question. Uh, let me uh, tell you a little bit about my, my situation. During the uh, revolution, I wrote a book a short collection, a story that immediately banned and burned. After that, I decided to write for myself. After the revolution, they killed my brother. They gave us his body, but they didn't uh, let us to bury him. I don't want to tell this uh, sad story and change the direction of this panel. And again, uh, they didn't let my two younger sisters go to go to a school. And they arrested several times one of my brothers-in-law. My sister and her husband sentenced to death. Fortunately, they, 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 they escaped. Our house was attacked and pillaged. My family moved to Shiraz. Those days, I was a student in Tehran University. They suspended me and sentenced me. One day when I went to Shiraz to visit my, my, my mom, they arrested me. The first night of jail, as all of you know, is, is, is terrible. You know, it was horrendous and gruesome. I was surrounded by coldness and darkness. I hear voice shouting, um, yelling, the sound of gunfire. That night I promised to myself, if I got out from this place, I would get writing seriously. When I was released, I joined to Gorshiris Guru and I started writing for myself seriously without having any dream for publication. So this book, my short story collection, took eight years to be published. This one the Gypsy by the Fire took uh, almost 10 years to be published. And the third edition of Satan's Stone uh, was banned. And they told me you, you wrote about a dancer and um, a prostitute. I have been writing in internet, on internet since 2001. I wrote my memoir, my, my poetry, my different chapter of my novels and uh, essay articles. And as you can see, those pressures, those pressures uh, uh, gave me more incentive to write. You know, it was not easy. It was very painful. But at least I can say that I didn't give up. That was my story. Yeah. Well, thank you so, so much, Muniru. Um, that was certainly very powerful, a powerful testimony. And um, I guess, I don't know if I dare say that, we have kind of all been more or less in the same boat. So I think we all sympathize with that, and we all understand that. Thank you so, so much for, uh, again, for what you said. Now, uh, let's move to Ms. Shahnoush Farsipur. Uh, Shahnoush, can you please... Um, elaborate on how you feel about the situation, how the situation has affected you and your life and your writing. Uh, after revolution or before? Yes, revolution? after the revolution. Yeah. Uh, after revolution, I was in France and I studied Chinese and civilization, Ch civilization of China. Then I decided to go back to my country and I came back to my country. Uh, I went back to Iran and uh, I haven't uh, your photos. I don't know what's the problem. 
Okay, go right ahead. Don't worry about it. Go right ahead. Just continue. Okay. Uh, I was arrested with my all my family in uh, 1981 because of some journals that they found in the car of my mother. And then I uh, they they came and they arrested me because I was uh, I had written a letter for Mr. Masood Rajavi. Uh, I didn't send this letter, but uh, they arrested me and I spent in prison for four years and seven months. And it was a... Okay, I think I have lost Shahnoosh. Yeah. Okay, there she is back, okay. Oh my God. I, okay. I can't hear it. No, no, we have lost her. Just give Michael a minute. I'm sure he will. And Roya has just joined us. So, oh. Roya Hakakian. Let's see what happens. Hi there. Roya? Hello, everyone. Hello, Roya. It's very good that you have been able to join us. Let, let us see because Miss Farsipur was speaking when you joined. Let's see if we can get her back. We are just waiting for our tech guy, Michael, to try to get her back on. Okay, I'm still waiting to get Shahnoosh back. Not back yet. Okay, so let me just move on and introduce Roya in the meantime as we are working to get Shahnoosh back. Now, I do have Roya Hakakian's uh, bio here, so please allow me to read it for those who are online. Roya Hakakian was born in uh, 1966 in Iran and is an Iranian-American poet journalist and writer living in the United States. Hakokian became well known for her memoir, Journey from the Land of No, in 2004. Her essays on Iranian issues appear in the New York Times, the Washington Post, Wall Street Journal, and on NPR. Hakakian was a founding member of the Iran Human Rights Documentation Center and served on the Board of Refugees International. So, Ms. Hakakian, Roya, we are very glad that you were able to uh, join us. Um, I still cannot see you, so let's see what can be done. Um, I'm, I'm happy to be here also. Okay, great. Can you see us? Uh, I can see you. Okay, is your uh, video on? Um, I think so, yes. Okay, okay, so in the meantime, um, Roya, I just want to put you in the loop here. So the first question we are talking about, and Muniru has already spoken and Shahnoosh was in the middle of speaking, was how do you think the current dictatorship in Iran, whose reign began in 1979, with the success of the Islamic Revolution, has affected your life as a writer and your work? Okay, so we, Shahnoosh was in the middle of speaking about that. Let's see if we have her back. Shahnoosh, are you back? Yes, I am back. But okay, my pass. Yeah, I think the disruption was because Roya joined us late. So it was in the middle of the conference and things got a little bit mixed up there. But now we have you back. So you told us that you went back to Iran from France where you were to study uh, when the revolution happened. And you were talking about that. Now one question that came to my mind that I would like to hear from you is that why did you decide to go back to Iran? Now I know that, but maybe there are some viewers listening to us that they wouldn't understand why you decided to go back to Iran. So if you can just elaborate on that and continue to tell us how it affected you. Okay, because I was a writer, and as a writer, it was difficult to be a writer abroad, out of Iran. So I came back to my country, and I decided to live there and to be a person like other people. So I can. I must speak, or I don't know. Go ahead, go ahead. Yeah, please do. Okay. After prison, I decided to work. It was very difficult because it wasn't any job for the people like me. I wrote my book and I translated several books. And uh, one week after the death of Ayatollah Khomeini, 
my book to one the meaning of not appears in the uh, market and it was a very it has a very astonished uh, all the people like it and they bought it so the government was aware that somebody is Chanush Parsipur is now a little famous so they tried to destroy my situation I had another book, its name was uh, Women Without Men and uh, when this book published uh, they arrested me again again, and they burned, the, they confiscated the book and they banned all my books in Iran. Fortunately this book has published in more than 20 uh, languages now but uh, it was a very difficult moment and then I decided to uh, left to leave the country and live in the United States. Okay, thank you so so much Farnoosh. Um, uh, again, I, I appreciate that and uh, we will get back and we will discuss and we will open up the issues. Now let's go to Omid. Uh, Omid, can you please expand on the same topic and tell us how the revolution and its aftermath affected you and your writing? Um, I should say hi and thank you um, to everyone for the opportunity. Um, um, I, to put things in perspective, I, I should just um, remind you that I think g in terms of generation, we may be in different generation because at the time of the revolution I was only four. Mm -hmm. So my experience with the revolution was uh, coming from a minority with many difficulties was uh, more than anything the house burning riots in Shiraz, which I exactly remember the day that my mom took my hand, we ran away because the mob, the revolutionaries were coming and they were burning Baha'i houses. So my, exp my personal experience is, uh, starts from that age rather than being a mature or an adult dealing with the turmoil or traumas. Um, and if you think about that, I mean I keep repeating the same thing to my friends here uh, that uh, we, our generation, like many others in, in uh, Middle East, been through revolution, war, natural disasters, social abuses and uh, problems that we have are numerous compared to average life in uh, you know, Western society. So that deforms whatever is our identity, regardless of being a writer. I mean, you can be a cab driver and it's still, it deforms you, it changes you in a dramatic way, not necessarily helping you, but it just, uh, it's too much. Uh, and that's why uh, we hear the stories from um, from um, Sharnoush and Moniru that they, they everyone tries to stay in that situation and survive. But at this point, as far as I know, many people at the same time are looking for for an exit to get out to escape uh, because it's it's too much. Uh, so back to your question, uh, I think. Eventually, when I decided to become a writer, reading um, the, the works of um, you know, other writers, like exactly, I remember in high school time, I was reading um, uh, Women Without Men, you know, kids were, kids not, I mean, not kids necessarily, kids who were uh, interested in reading. When you decide to, to become a writer, you also decide that you're facing an uphill challenge you don't know exactly where you go and as Munir said you don't know even if you get published no dreams you just think this is something I want to do and I think later if we talk I think I have some some um, thoughts or explanation about that too why even without no reward or dream you still think that writing is something you want to do uh, you want to dedicate yourself to that Thank you so, so much, Omid, for your insight. You know, I think one of the important things that you touched on, but that was that this situation currently in Iran that uh, began in 1979, it has affected more than one generation. And I think that's also very important to keep in mind how these various generations of people, uh, they have been affected by it. And, and I'm very glad to hear your perspective on that, because I was 13 when the revolution happened, and Muniru and uh, Shahnush were just a little bit older than, uh, older than that. They were university students. So again, these are various uh, experiences coming in. I'm very glad that we can actually see Roya 
So that's fabulous. I'm just so glad to see you, Roya. Hi. So, Roya, the first question, I'm going to read it for you just in case you missed it. Um, Can I say hello, hello to everyone? Hi, hello. Hi, Roya. Hello. Okay, so I'm going to give you the first question and please jump in. And uh, we are asking, you know, for, for answers that are not more than two, three, four minutes because we want to kind of go around and try to have a discussion uh, around various issues. So the first question we are commenting on is how do you think the current dictatorship in Iran, whose reign began 1979, with the success of the Islamic Revolution, has affected your life as a writer and your works? So, Roya, if you want to jump in there. Mm -hmm. It's, it's uh, like asking how do you live with the elephant in the middle of the room, you know. Mm, pretty much. Uh, there, there is nothing else that um, can affect any writer, I suppose, uh, more than um, having to try to cope with uh, first witnessing a revolution, then all the fallout from that revolution, then being transplanted uh, on another continent, um, so I it's it's that when you say the dictatorship, the dic it it's actually simplifying uh, the issue because it, it's far more complex. Uh, the dictatorship is one thing, but uh, the dictatorship has produced a, a, a flurry of other outcomes that those have touched all of our lives. The dictatorship has put Shahnush in prison, the dictatorship has driven um, uh, our Omid uh, out of the country, the dictatorship moved me and separated me from my family and threw me all the way uh, first in Europe and in, in the United States. So. Uh, the dictatorship isn't a static thing. It really deeply touched all of our lives, and as a result of it, I, I don't. I think it continues to be the elephant in the middle of the room, and we will probably, one way or another, uh, continue to write about it for for many, many years. Even okay. when we don't write about it, <laughs> I think yeah, we're writing I, I, about it. Yes, yes, you're absolutely right. Uh, now. Um, from here, um, let's actually move on, I guess, touching on what you just said. Now, when we say a dictatorship in general, uh, there have been various dictatorships on the face of the planet, and I don't think um, in any case they can be simplified. Uh, simplified. They all have consequences. They have severe consequences. Sometimes they take thousands, sometimes millions of lives. So when we say dictatorship, um, we are not trying to simplify anything here. Dictatorship usually means terrible loss of life, of intellect, and of a lot of other things. It means family being families being torn apart. And I think all of us, we can easily say that we have friends and family members buried in mass graves in various parts of Iran. And well, we, all of us, we are writers in exile right now, so we have all been separated from um, the place where we were born, the place that we loved, and we have had to leave family members behind. But the, what what this it takes me again, it, it actually this is the perfect pretext for the next question because um, most of us, most writers and journalists and poets and inter intellectuals, they have experienced torture, imprisonment and um, horrible things in Iran. And this cannot be downplayed at all. And these events, these are terribly traumatic events and they terribly affect people. Now, uh, you know, post-traumatic stress disorder is a very wide-ranging word. So, you know, I, I don't even want to use it. But, but I just want to say that we have all been terribly affected psychologically, physically, practically. We have suffered from it. So my next question is, um, because, um, well, we have a dictatorship right now that has been... Um, ongoing for the past 30 something years and before that we had the time of the Shah and that was a dictatorship in a different form but nevertheless it was still the dictatorship. So basically we have been dealing with a very long uh, many many years of dictatorship. So this has affected us and we have all suffered. So uh, can you, I'm asking this from all of you, can you be specific as do you think that this situation, this horrible situation has uh, created any form of self-censorship or any form of peer censorship 
within the Iranian diaspora community. Now, I have my own experiences from that. But I think this is something we need to talk about as Iranian writers, because again, in my experience, we have been affected by it, some more, some less. But uh, let's start with, with uh, Muniro Ravoni, poor Muniro, I know that you have to go earlier. So would you like to comment on that? Do you think that there has been self-censorship or peer censorship within the Iranian diaspora community? Um, Mariana. I can't stop being afraid of my own voice. Mm -hmm. Now, always I ask myself, am I a real writer? Can I write whatever I want when my friend, student, family are in, Shira, in, in Iran? I don't want to hurt them. I don't want to write something that, put, that would put them in danger. Because of this, I, I, I am not free, actually. I can't follow my imagination and my dream, even that I am here for a long time. You know, I have to protect them. I am responsible toward my friends, my family, my students. When I, wa I want to, to, to write a sentence, I'm always, you know, think about them. I worry. This is, this is whatever I, I can say to you about my situation. Yeah. Well, uh, that's, I guess, touching on, on one side of this um, self-censorship, which is the fear. It is the fear for people who still have close family members in Iran. And even though uh, writers are, are abroad, they are in various countries, in Europe, in the United States, they still feel that fear that what if I write something and the Iranian authority go after my family. And that fear is very, very real. And you, you, people struggle with it all the time. You, you see, my, my, Mariana, I want, to, I, I want to write without shame and without guilt. And because of this, I, I, I really uh, think about those friends that I have in Iran. I am here in land of freedom, in land of opportunity. But what if I write a sentence and put them in debt? It is yes. shame. It is shame for me. It is shame to put someone in uh, in danger or hurt, hurt anybody. Mm -hmm. Yes, because I understand that now. Uh, Shahnoush, can we move to you uh, now? Uh, how do you feel about that? I know that you know a while ago after my first book was published, we had a little conversation on the phone and we talked a little bit about more or less the same situation. But how do you see self censorship or censorship within? the Iranian diaspora community. How does it affect you and the people that you know? You know, Marina, when you are in when you are in society, you are like a prisoner because you are surrounded by other people. And all the people have some senses and some um, intelligence that it doesn't work with your your uh, your intelligence. So this is the problem that uh, we have in Iran in, and all the countries that they haven't uh, <clears throat> they haven't uh, liberty. So yes, I, I, I have a very a strong self censorship, and I use it because, like many of you, I don't want to hurt anybody. Okay, now, is there any uh, feeling in any other way, like you talked about self-censorship, but have you ever said or published anything that had to do with your opinion or with what you feel about something, and then you were attacked by other writers, other members of the diaspora community condemning you and attacking you in a very limited and sometimes aggressive way? Have you ever had that experience? Not really, because when I write, I think about all the people, so I am aware of the problem, the problem of the people, and they never attack me really. Well, that's good. That's very good and lucky, then I would say. Okay, um, Roya, do you have anything to add to this discussion? Um, not really. I uh, switched from writing in Persian, which is how I started out as a writer, to writing in English. And uh, much of my work remains in English. And um, 
I I have found some difficulty writing in writing the journalism that I write in English, uh, where I get you know nasty emails and um, as most recently last week, uh, but it doesn't affect the way I write. I no, but, but you know what what I'm saying here is what are those nasty emails? What are they about? You know I'm trying to open up this issue. Um. Uh, that's interesting. They they um, oftentimes uh, they are about my having been away from Iran and therefore not having the right to talk about Iran anymore. Um, oftentimes I'm told, "What do you know? You left twenty some years ago, and uh, you no longer know who's in Iran, who's running Iran. You have no sense of what this country was like." And and it's very interesting because uh, I say that to people who come. Uh, you know, on a regular basis from Iran, that you're only good for the first year that you're here, because after that you you're like milk, you expire. Um, mm -hmm. You know, and and so um, it, that's that's one line of attack. The other is you're Jewish. You know, Jews don't know uh, Jews' right to support Israel, and you are opposing the regime in your journalism because you're Jewish and you want to strengthen. Uh, the hands of right-wing Israelis. Uh, so that's the second line of attack that I get. And the third uh, is often um, just a general um, attack on you know being a woman and being a modern woman who knows nothing about the plight of religious women in Iran. That uh, you know modern Iranian women who lived without a veil, who lived in Tehran. Uh, are a minority who have no idea of what the majority of Iranian women who were veiled, who were Muslim, who had to uh, work in the fields or on the farms, uh, have no clue about, and we should therefore um, not say anything and not write about these issues. So, um, I, I, the, these these three themes keep coming up, and uh, rather than cause self censorship, I just uh, they just do me a lot of good. I I like getting nasty emails. They make me stronger, and I write even more. Okay, that's fantastic. I'm very glad that you brought up this other side of it, of getting, you know, again, nasty emails because people disagree with you, because people don't like your religion, because people don't like your political standing. And I'm then, not religious at all, in fact. No, 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 I understand. Secular. I understand. No, no, it, this is not about that. This is downright about being intolerant. This is about attacking the ones who are different. This is attacking the ones who don't exactly agree with us in whatever way. This has nothing to do with, with, with being religious or anything. But, but when people know that you're a Jew, when people know that you're a Baha'i, when people know that you're a Christian, even if you have never set foot in a synagogue or a church or a temple, that is how they see you. They don't see you as a thinker, as a writer, as a human being who has the right to accept himself or herself, but they could see you as just that, that one-dimensional idea of a Jew or a Christian or a Baha'i or, you know, whatever. And sometimes this enters the political sphere because you don't belong to the same political right or left as I do, then you're less than a human being and you're not allowed to speak. So, you know, the, the, one of the things here is that sometimes we bring this idea of stalking the people who disagree with us because this is something we have lived with all of our lives more or less because this is the kind of situation we have lived in in Iran since any of us can remember that if somebody disagrees with you they are not allowed to speak and sometimes we bring that with us to the diaspora and we attack each other unfortunately not us like per se our group but I mean Iranians within the diaspora community. So I mean, it would be interesting to see what your opinion is. Uh, I just want to make it short, but uh, I think the idea of self-censorship comes from always thinking or internalizing this thought that there is consequences for what I write. Something bad is going to happen to someone, to me, to others, to whoever reads this, and you keep looking over your shoulder that what is the outcome of this writing this time? If I write this this way, who is going to be, you know, harmed? And 
uh, this is to me, I think. I mean, I, I as I said, I'm a little bit relatively younger, and I started writing again with less hope, but eventually towards the reform uh, era, and when I get a little bit published. But you always think about that, that um, what is the consequences of this piece of writing uh, to others and to yourself? Um, and it's in there. I don't know how you can get rid of it, but it needs practice. It needs time. Uh, and in terms of diaspora, I believe, again, based on agenda, if we call ourselves diaspora, if we believe in a you know common myth, myth that we're going to go back to Iran or we are related to Iran all the time, based on agenda, yes, definitely you get uh, signals of censorship that don't say this, don't do that. That would help you know those people who would be thinking about war or starting a war with Iran. I hear that because they say, why you portray Iran with this human right issues? It just helps those people who are against, you know, uh, oh, who are, as I said, who are uh, planning a war against Iran. And it is difficult. Uh, but at the same time, panels like this or discussion and even more writing will help, hopefully. Um, Thank you, Omid. I think you brought up a very important issue, and that is that, yes, when you speak about, when you write about, like even in the form of fiction, when you write about human rights abuses, like terrible human rights abuses, hor horrific human rights abuses, in Iran, then, you know, people within the community, they would come to you and they would say, why are you writing about this? You're, are you asking for Iran to be attacked? And then you find yourself defending uh, yourself at the whole time saying, no, I have written about this because this is reality, because this is what is happening. People have been dying since I can remember. So by covering it up and not talking about it and pretending it's not happening, I'm not going to help nobody. This mm -hmm. is reality, and I'm writing about reality, even if in the form of fiction. So, yes, that, that uphill battle that I think all of us we have faced in one way or another. And yes, it, it, as Roya explained, I think it gives all of us, in a way, more determination because mm -hmm. you feel that you have stepped on toes here, some, some very big toes in, in some cases, and you feel even more determined to, to keep on going, to keep on writing, and to keep on exposing uh, all of these abuses and all these horrible things that you know all of us every single one of us on this panel, in one way or another, we have been touched. I mean, you know, the Shahnoush was in prison, I was in prison, uh, Muniru has um, had family members, she has lost family members, she's had family in prison. I mean, you are Baha'i, so we know how horrible Baha'i are being treated in Iran. They are not even acknowledged as a religious minority. I have Baha'i uh, family members. And I'm always worried about them. So this has affected all of us for sure. But something that was uh, touched on, and I think it is important, is how do you think, and this just came up, so this is not exactly in the list of the questions, but how do you think this issue of time and that we have been away from Iran, and because we have been away from Iran, we are not allowed to have an opinion about what's going on there right now, or we are not allowed to write about it right now. How do you feel about that, Muniru? We are going to start with you again. Pardon me, I didn't hear you. OK, so the question is, uh, I think it was Roya who brought it up, or it was, no, I think it was Roya, that because we have been away uh, from oh. Iran, for, uh, uh, you know, yes, let's say any time more than a year, then we are not allowed to write about Iranian issues, we are not allowed to speak. Some people see it that way, and as Roya put it, it's like we are like milk that has an expiry date on it. So, uh, so how do you feel about that? Have, have you ever been told that? And if you have, how how, how you responded? Uh, you know, with internet, with this kind of networking that we have, then nobody ha nobody can say this this naive word. Now, we we can connect to to uh, to to the to country in a second. Every night I can Skype to everybody all around the country. My connection is more uh, stronger than before. When I was in Iran, I was in Tehran. I was sitting at the at, at my apartment and thinking about the situation, the dark situation. Now, from this distance, I can look at everything and I, I can see more clear than, than before. Um, I think this is, this is, a, this is a hardy thing, this is incredible. I, I don't believe it, and I think this kind of uh, 
says is uh, that is because they want to push us on the corner. Yes, they want to blame us. Uh, okay. I don't believe Thank it. You. Thank you. Thank you so much. Roya, do you want to add anything to that? Well, yes. Uh, I think, I in a way, those of us who write fiction, uh, Shahnoush, Moniru, um, have an easier time with the question of how long is it that you've been away. Um, I happen to have written two books of nonfiction, and, and I think that becomes more problematic if you're writing nonfiction or journalism or um, opinion essays, then the question becomes, when was the last time you were there? If you weren't there on the ground, you have no, you, you, you uh, lose your credibility. But uh, actually, I, I very much agree with what Muniru just said, that it's not only that the social networking uh, systems connect us, it's also that I think you need to be away from, from the mayhem inside Iran, from from the darkness in order to see it in light that mm, in fact I think those who are inside the country ha living under the censorship not having access are the ones who have a more a narrower view and probably uh, a more limited expression and those of us who get away establish ourselves um, spend a few years being depressed and worried and anxious and then overcome those difficulties hopefully um, manage to finally be able to uh, see the situation in light, uh, in light of freedom, in light of uh, all the beautiful things that living in a, in a non-censorship country affords us. Yeah, actually you made a very good point. You brought up the issue of perspective. So sometimes when you're drowning in the middle of a dark storm with waves crashing over your head and you know the heaven and the earth look the same, uh, it is very difficult to see uh, the sort of trouble that you're actually in. It's very difficult for you to have perspective. It's only when you look at it from the outside that you can actually see the depth of the problem mm -hmm. and the depth of the situation. I totally agree with that. So yeah, I think we, we all agree on that so far. Uh, Shahnoush, would you like to add anything to this? You know, my literature has a place in Iranian modern literature. Right. It doesn't matter that I am there or I am here, because I am in contact with everybody in Iran, and naturally I know I have a situation there. Exactly, yes. and you have uh, lived a large part of your life in that country, right? Mariana, yes? Ma Mar Mariana, I want to, to add something. You know, the border, uh, you, can't, you can't define border, uh, exile in border. But when you are alone, you are abandoned in your country, you are in exile, you know? Then, uh, I, actually, I didn't, I, I couldn't write in Tehran when I was in Tehran. I was very confused. I couldn't think. Exactly. So they, they, just, they just want to say that the literature is inside of country is much better than the rest. Those writers that are writing outside, that there is no outside or inside. <laughs> you are exactly. all writers. That is an excellent point. Yeah. Very, very good point here, Muniru. Thank you. Omid, would you like to add anything? Um, I, I just want to say, as far as we talk about it and we write about it, we write about it. No one can say you have the right or you're allowed or you're not allowed. Mm -hmm. And uh, history has shown, I mean, James Joyce wrote about Dublin when yeah, he wasn't there, exactly. and he wasn't exactly. there, and he wasn't there. And it, it, it you know, the, after 100 years, still the best pieces you can read about that, that city, that people. So uh, I think we shouldn't argue about that. We write about it, they can say that whatever they say, uh, uh, and then the history will show, or the readers, yeah. actually. Absolutely. I think the readers will be the final judges of this. Um, mm -hmm. So actually, you know what, guys, I, I think we could kind of take a break here in the sense that I have some questions from uh, the people who are actually online listening to us. So I think it is important to acknowledge them. Uh, so um, here I have one viewer question. So if you could please um, pay attention to it. I'm going to read it slowly. Is it difficult to reconnect or stay connected with the literary scene of Iran while living in a foreign country? I think to a certain degree we have responded to that, that with the online world it's actually easier to connect with writers when you're abroad than it is to connect with writers when you're inside of Iran. 
now uh, do you agree with that uh, Omid what do you think uh, I think uh, Monir would be uh, Monir and Sharnoush. I don't know about Roya, but I think they're really well connected with the literary scene in Iran. Mm -hmm. I'm less because this switch to writing in English okay. takes a lot of energy and time, and I have to be very selective once in a while. Look over and see what's out there from Iran in mm -hmm. more, more than anything in fiction, obviously. Um, but it's not that hard. I mean, it's just a matter of discipline or intention. Do you want to stay connected? So you have to get the books and read them and read about them. Um, mm -hmm. If it's the matter of connection, means just getting information. If to be active, that's a different story. I don't know how you can write here and hope that you get published there or get read there. That's a di that's a different story. And I, as I believe, I really believe uh, Bonir and uh, Shahnush are more um, uh, aware of the situation. And, Okay, okay, so let's go to Moniru. Moniru, what, what do you think about it? I have 10 Facebook and many readers. You know, the time that we, 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 we the, the, the time of riding camel is over. Yeah. So, you know, we, we, we have internet, Facebook, mm -hmm. Twitter, everything. And every day, every second, I can uh, uh, connect to anybody I want. Then what is that? I, I didn't know. have, you know, no, Mariano. I didn't have uh, so many friends that I uh, that I have right now in all my life. <laughs> so I write something. I write something. On Are you Facebook. sure they're friends, Mariano? <laughs> yeah, all of them. All of them. Read it. No, no. I, 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 I have those 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 those, those buddies that uh, writing to you, Roya. Those letters. I have some of them, but I I, I know them. So, do you? What do they I, say to you? <laughs> oh, they they just tell us about my they talk, they they ask me about my my life. Are you the, uh, alone? Are you single? Or are you living with your husband? It, it, it's still living with your husband. They are curious about my life mostly. Uh -huh. And but sometimes they say, know. Oh, oh, you get you 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 got too old. And I say, Okay, yes, I, uh, everybody get uh, will get to uh, your age. Everybody getting old, and this is not only me. But I know that they come. They come from where? So, but I have a lot of readers. Ten thousand, really. I put one there video. You, I, you know, I read. I read a story. Uh, the, 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 uh, I'm dancing in the red square or Naraya uh, Mastane. Ooh, how can I publish a story and I get this kind of readers? You know, it is. It is. It is. It is not. Uh, um, uh, uh, it is ridiculous saying this. Okay, no, I, I, I think you know it's it's easy at this point to just wrap this up and say you know what this is absolutely ridiculous. We are as connected to Iran as anybody can be. I mean, we are actually more connected to Iran now that we live abroad than when we lived in Iran. And Shahnush, do you agree with that? That we are more connected than ever? Yes, of course. There we go. So we all agree on that. Let's move on a little bit now. Yeah. You know, I can also, also I'm still reading the re the viewers' questions, and one of them here actually that I'm seeing on the uh, on my screen has to do with the issue of language. And oh. That's actually a place that I that I wanted to get to, but we are tight on time, so I'm going to jump uh, to that one. And the question that that we have here, it, it because we are Iranian writers, we studied, we went to school in Iran. Our first language, or my my first language, is Russian. But most of you, your first language is Persian. So you know how difficult it is when it comes to translation or writing in a di different language, because every language has its soul. So when you switch from one language to the other, whether you are now writing in a different language or when your works are being translated into another language, which is one of the readers, uh, the viewers' questions, um, do you think? How do you think think that affects your writing? How different do you think it, it is to write in different language? So um, you know, again, because Moniru has to go, she has yeah. a doctor's appointment. So I'm going to go to her because she might have to leave. So I apologize. Yeah. Okay, Moniru, so go much. ahead. Thank you so much. You see, the, the the first, the immediate problem, the immediate challenge for me was language. You know, I was in a land of freedom. You know, freedom of speech, but I couldn't speak. <laughs> In which language I have to speak? I, I have been writing for, in Persian for all my time, and now new audience, new culture, new people, new language. 
You know, I, 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 I really try to learn English to, to communicate with my colleagues, but it was not easy. For, for, for three, three years, I was wondering whether I should write in English or, or, or Persian. For mm -hmm. one year, I started writing my memoir in English, and after that, I switched back in, 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 in uh, Persian. And then finally, you know, Mariana, I told myself, stop it. Don't kill yourself. Write whatever you want, you want and however you can. Okay? But, you know, writing about yeah. traditional things, writing about my hometown, South, South of Iran. Mm -hmm. South is always South for me. South of Iran, you know, our tradition, our ceremony, torturing, arresting, gothic and grotesque story. It is much easier for me to write in Persian. But when I want to write about love, the beauty of the human body, uh, it, is, it is much easy for me to write it in English. And I don't know why, really. <laughs> That's yeah. interesting. You brought us something very interesting here. Shahnoosh, yeah. what do you think? Oh, can I go, please? I, 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 yes, I'm yeah. very sorry. I have an appointment with Dr. Thank you so much, and kiss all of you, and love all of you. Okay, bye. you too, Munira. Thank, thank you. you. Bye. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you, thank you, thank you Mariana. Bye-bye. Thank bye. you, bye. Munira. We'll talk later. Bye-bye. Sahnoush, uh, what do you think about this? What role does language play for you? Uh, I wrote, uh, I have written always in Persian, uh, but uh, all of my books have translated into English. Uh, and other languages, I think I'm not sure if they are good uh, translations. For example, I can read German or Polish, so I don't know. Uh, till now, I didn't try. I haven't tried to write in English, but essentially, sometimes I write something in English. Okay. Okay. So you are basically working in Farsi. Uh, so how about you, Roya? Because I know you write a lot in English. So how does it work for you? Um, um, when I wrote my memoir, it was my first uh, real experience writing in long form uh, because I, even in Persian, I had only primarily written poetry. Um, and then not only writing in long form prose for the first time, but also uh, writing in English. And uh, it's, it's uh, probably among the most important, significant, life-changing experiences of my life. Uh, because I think that I learned to uh, think in a way that I couldn't with my Iranian head. Um, in order to write proper English prose, I had to also uh, think the way an American does. And an American or an English writing person doesn't think the way an Iranian or English writing, uh, Persian writing person thinks. Can you elaborate on that exactly in um, what way? You know, in, in Farsi, we take lots of liberties. We are not supposed to... Uh, we celebrate ambiguity, we celebrate indirectness, we uh, celebrate complexity in writing, especially in writing poetry and prose. And uh, in English, uh, none of these things are considered virtue. Uh, indirectness, ambiguity, uh, unnecessary complexity uh, are all considered um, things that get in the way of communication with the reader and these are all the things that you're supposed to mm, work on, edit, uh, redraft, rewrite uh, in order to change. You're not supposed to use too many metaphors. They get in the way of communicating clearly and directly with your audience. So um, I basically had to learn to look uh, with my Iranian eyes at through the American perspective and and that was uh, probably one of the best uh, writing educations I've ever received <coughs> it wasn't so much that anybody you know I went to writing school or uh, novel writing school or nonfiction writing school it was just having to make the philosophical and uh, the transition in the perspective from a Persian writer 
to a Persian a writer who li writes in in the Persian medium to a writer who uh, writes relatively effectively in the English medium and that transition uh, was a whole MFA and writing education for me in a way that nothing else uh, mm -hmm. has ever been. That's very interesting. Thank you. You know, one of the things about language that I, I find, you know, it, it, it was a, an interesting discovery for me was that when I wrote my first memoir, Prisoner of Tehran, I actually find, found it much, much easier to write in English than, than I found writing in Farsi. And, and one of the things I later discovered when I was talking to psychologists and psychiatrists was that when there is a terribly traumatic experience, which mine, I guess, would qualify, writing in different lang language actually creates an emotional barrier. So this is why many writers who have gone through traumatic experiences, they write about that experience in another language. And people don't realize that using another language actually creates um, a sort of um, almost a safety net. And uh, it makes it emotionally less uh, painful to write about a difficult experience. That, that was my experience of writing in English. Now, Omid, uh, what do you think about this? Because I know you were interested in this. Uh, I think I, I, I just want to say that I agree with uh, what Roya said. And it's even more uh, problematic, or it magnifies, when, when an uh, Iranian, for example, writes in English and, and uses any technique or style elements that has ambiguity in it or uh, things like that becoming okay. being a little bit experimental they look at you like uh, like you don't get it and they want to correct you and they want to tell you no you have to write a straight clear things like that mm -hmm. uh, I just mean any intentional um, you know uh, maneuver that you have in your writing style to them is, a, is something that they think that could be a problem and they try to correct you, uh, your readers, your um, editor or whoever you work with. And this is something that you have to deal with. Um, so uh, th there is a really big, big change from the literary scene in Iran when I, you know, I was trying to write short stories or uh, a novel in, in Iran 15 years ago compared to what I'm trying to do now. Uh, um, uh, in terms of the language itself uh, and the way it can feel, you know, a little, a little comfortable with it, um, I feel it's it's something that requires again more um, a conversation and flow of information. I'm curious about you know Roya's work and your work uh, that. How you started writing in English? What was the you know phases you went through? And I have my own experience that I like to share with people and get a better sense of this. Other than that, it's it's less known. It's a little bit mysterious. I mean, you, even writing fiction in your own language is a little bit mysterious when you have a successful piece of work. But writing in a different language, then you have all these questions about how people handle the language uh, uh, and and. And again, felt comfortable about it. Uh -huh. um, you read about Nabokov, you read about Conrad, and then uh, now you have a, a, a generation of people from Middle East, Africa, uh, even Europe, that they, they write in English as a second language. Um, um, I'm just a student of that field, I believe. Uh -huh. I like to learn about that. Yeah, I, I guess that that is definitely a very important topic. Now, I, 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 from my experience, every, ev again, every individual writer is different. Like, my English was already very good when I arrived here in Canada in 1990. So, using English language was not an obstacle for me at all. I, I had all my life, I, I had read books in English. And English was my third language. Russian was my first. So, some of the problems Royal and you have had in, in uh, when it comes to the style of writing in Farsi, I know what you're talking about, those complications, those long sentences, those long paragraphs. I never had, had to deal with that because, again, my background was Russian and I had read English literature all my life. So, I didn't have to battle with that problem. Now, because we are very tight on time, we are extremely tight on time. There's this one question here that um, it, it could be, you know, interesting for our viewers to hear. It is a viewer question, uh, and it says, uh, "Are there independent writers associations in Iran today? If so, how effective are they in defending freedom of expression?" So, uh, Roya, do you want to tackle it? Um, I, I wish uh, Moniru and Shahnush were on. I know that. 
Yeah, I think from time to time, uh, there have been efforts by writers inside Iran to uh, have groups together, to bring those gr groups together. Um, and uh, as soon as they have had something going, uh, there has been a crackdown. So um, as far as I'm concerned, uh, there are none. Uh, or if there are any, there are no, um, there isn't any that's uh, really effective. That's right. I, I totally agree with you. Omid, what do you think? I think I have to say no comments because I, I don't know much. I know, I mean, I know the stories. I know everything that we know about uh, 10, 15 years ago, or more, even before that, and, and what happened to many writers. Uh, and then after that, uh, it was more difficult. At this point, at this time, I, I really don't know exactly how they organize and how effective they are. I know they have difficulty and they want to do something, but uh, I think it's very limited. Yes, it is very limited. And what I hear from friends inside Iran, again, talking to them online, uh, basically, yes, there are writers, writers groups and they get together and they try to do things, but it's impossible to get published because uh, the Ministry of Information doesn't allow these works to get published. And uh, there, there is a lot of crackdown. So if they discover that you have been gathering, like a group of writers, thinkers, they have been gathering, the next thing you know, you know you're in prison. So that's basically more or less out of the question. So the answer to that question, I guess, is that no, there aren't any effective. Now, again, it depends on what that means. But our time is up. So unfortunately, we have to say goodbye. But uh, it was an absolute pleasure and an honor to uh, meet all of you, to have the opportunity to uh, talk to you. And I, I have to uh, say thank you to Samsonia Way and to Orlando especially for facilitating this, for sending all of those emails, and I thank everybody who joined us online. Uh, thank you so, so much, and I certainly hope to do this again. So thank take you. care, everybody. Roya, Omid, you're still here. Thank you so, bye so bye. much. Take care. Thank bye you bye. so much. Bye. Bye.